Well, for our next talk, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rosario Duran. Rosario is the head of UBIPA, Unidad de Bioquímica y Proteómica Analíticas, from Institute Pasteur, Montevideo. And Rosario has decades of experience in proteomics and being the, the director of the facility. And while we are coming into the phase of the program, we are focusing in interactomics. So this talk would is ideal to kick off that part, focusing on the, the subject of the course that is interactomics. Thank you, Rosario, for being here. All yours. Thank you very much to you, Germán, and to Nico. Uh, very thank you very much for the invitation. For me, it's really a pleasure to be here and to be in a presential course after two long years of doing Zooms. So thank you very much. We are experiencing some problems with the presentation, so <laughs> I'm sorry, but we cannot move the slides. Uh, we don't know why. So anyway, I can start uh, telling you about the presentation. Yes, working, perfect. No, no, <laughs> no, but well, I can, I can you sit here from yeah. here? I can move it from here. Okay, so um, the idea of this presenta presentation is to give you an introduction to proximity proteomics and this, this kind of, of methodology is uh, called in general proximity proteomics, but I'm in particular I'm going to talk about two uh, biotinylation, proximity dependent biotinylation, are used to um, map or uh, to explore the proteomic environment of a desired protein, of a protein of our interest, can be many proteins of our interest, and to identify all the proteins that are around. So, let me use it from here. Why it's important to study that? Well, as uh, Pia showed you in the morning, using proteomics, we can identify a lot of proteins, thousands of proteins that are present in different cells, in different tissues, in different fluids, in, in a very short time. But this information about the, pros the proteins present in a sample is not enough to understand what is going on in the cell and to explain how the cell works at a, a molecular level. That's because most proteins, all proteins can maybe say, works, uh, do, do not work alone. They do not act alone. They work together. They interact with other proteins, with other molecules, and uh, the function of the proteins is based on these specific interactions and on its subcellular localization. So, in fact, uh, these proteins can be of different type. So we have a permanent interaction. So our proteins that in the cell, they are most of the time interacting, but we also have trans transient interactions. That is, interactions that are forming and disassembled in the, in the cell. And this can be weak or can be strong. So there's a lot of kind of interactions that we need to study. And all of these have its biological relevance. So uh, for a long time, many years ago and, and until now, there are a lot of approaches that are being actively studied and developed to study interaction networks and subcellular proteomes. And one of these approaches is the one I'm going to tell you today. So, uh, the classical way, and it's still very useful, and you are going to perform this if I don't understand, if I understood correctly, in the practical course, is to perform the classical affinity purification coupled to MS approach that is, has been used a lot, is really useful to identify partners, but it also has some limitations. In this approach, basically, what we do is we rely on different uh, known interactions, for example, antigen antibody or an enzyme inhibitor or receptor ligand to purify our protein. And with the protein, we aim to bring all the partners that are interacting with it in the cell. So in I this means that we have to break the cell perform lysis, uh, and then from there, capture the protein, 
with all the interactors and then perform several wash steps to get rid of these interactors that we don't need. And after that, we perform enzymatic digestion and we couple this, oh, forget about that, uh, with nano LC MS MS analysis to identify the protein parts. So this works well and just to uh, no. give you some more information on how this happened, this is a typical chromatogram when we have here the time and here the total ion currents and all, all these things are the intensity of the, the sum of the intensity of the ions that have been eluding from the column. But if we take this special time point, 74.18, we can see that at this moment, we are detecting all these peptides and as you, as you asked this, this morning, this data dependent acquisition will automatically select the top N, let's say we select 12, we can tell the mass spec how to do that. So it selects the most intense peaks and automatically triggers the fragmentation. So it will fragment 10 ions and then go back to the MS mode and acquire a new spectra. So as you can see here, the time difference is very small and we have an awful lot of information. And what is important is that we do that using what we call an exclusion list, dynamic exclusion. So after I fragment this ion, this ion, this ion, this ion, this ion, in the next step, I already, I still have them here and I will fragment 10 ions more that are below the intensity of those. So at the end, for example, here, I highlight this mass because this is the M over C value that was fragmented in the last. And if you look here, we have no sign of there. So we have to make a zoom and you see that there's small ion here that corresponds to this mass. So this is why this, this methodology has a very high dynamic range and we can detect a lot of things that are very, are low abundant in the presence of things that are very high abundance, okay? So this is the general strategy, and as I said to you, it has some drawbacks. So in the first place, when we break the cell, we might lose, we, we usually lose weak and transient interactions because we are diluting the sample, we are allowing things to uh, become apart. And also membrane proteins are very difficult to recover. Why? Because we have to do this purification in soft conditions uh, so we can preserve the interactions that were taking place in the cell. If we use detergents or, or, or very harsh conditions, these interactions are going to break and we are not going to recover the, the interactors. And for membrane proteins, you know that we need these harsh conditions to, to recover the proteins. So in most cases, it's uh, in some cases it works, but in many cases it's not very easy to recover membrane proteins as interactors using this approach. And the other thing is that we have um, some uh, noise because there are new interactions that are going to be formed because we are putting together proteins that were not in the same place in the cell. So they are going to we're, we are going to be forming new interactions that were not present in the context of the cell, of the living cell. So this is some, these are some of the drawbacks of this method. And the other one, and probably the most important one that you have to take into account to have to recover real interactors is that as this technique is very sensitive and we can identify a lot of proteins that are very low abundant, we have a lot of uh, background proteins that they are not interacting with our bait, but they are interacted with the solid support, with the protein we have coupled to in a specifically or whatever. So these background proteins are a lot, are a huge amount of proteins, and we have to know them because we have to subtract them to, have to fish the real interactors. So just as an example, this, of course, the, this uh, this background can be optimized, we can change the way we wash the columns, we can change the number of washes, we can change many things to make this uh, go down, but 
it will always exist. And uh, this is just an example of, of one of our interactors, but this is the blank. This is just the support that has a specific antibody or that has even nothing. And, and as you can see, we can recover as high as 1,300 proteins and all this lot of, of peptides identified in this sample. And this sample is nothing. It's, n it's not a real one. So if we compare this with our real interactome analysis, we can then fish proteins that are, here, are present here, but are much, much more enriched in our interactome. <coughs> and uh, vice versa, we can see that the, we have a protein in our interactome, but it's at the same level as the background. So we have to really subtract it. So this is important because compared to other biochemical approaches, we used to see an interactor in interactome is present, we identify it, and we said this is an, an interactor. Here, we cannot say that. We have to rely in quantitative proteomic to really identify, identify um, bona fide interactors. So, based on this, I'm not going to take about classical interactomic approach because this is about proximity proteomics, but uh, this, uh, these difficulties that were found in this classical approach uh, make uh, the research community to find new methods that can do those two things. On, or preserve the interaction in some way, the, as it was in the cell, so we can use harsh conditions here and nothing will happen because, for example, our proteins are co covalently labeled and that is the cross-linking thing that probably <coughs> um, Herman is going to show you afterwards. And the other thing is to label the interactor. So you can introduce a covalent label in your interactor. And then, of course, you can again use harsh conditions because this protein is going to be labeled and you will be able to purify and recognize. So this is exactly this last, is exactly what I'm going to talk to you about. And it's this, what is called proximity-dependent biotinylation. And the general strategy for this approach is to express in your system your protein of interest, the base, coupled to an enzyme that is proximity-dependent biotinylation enzyme, that is the one who is going to be responsible for the covalent modification of the partner by introducing this molecule here that is a biotin. So, uh, you have to express your bite fused to this protein in your cellular system. And then the protein that is not, a pr uh, uh, it's an engineered protein, it's, it's especially designed for this purpose, will introduce the biotin. So which are the advantages of this strategy? Well, labeling can be performed in, li in live cells or even in whole organisms, so you are going to be looking at what really is happening inside the cell. You can use very harsh conditions to recover proteins, to wash your sample, to have cleaner and less background because your, co your modification is going to be covalent. <coughs> and you will al also introduce a biotin. That is very convenient because there are many commercial systems that are devised to recover and to purify bio biotinylated proteins. So the big advantages of this, that I will tell you later, is also can be also a disadvantage, is that to purify biotin, we have a lot of system based on m mostly avidin biotin, but also other proteins as neutravidin or streptavidin, and this interaction is among the strongest not covalent interaction in nature, which is supposed to be orders of, of magnitude higher than the average antibody antigen interaction. And this allows us to use a lot of washes and detergents, as, as I told you before, to recover the, the biotin-related proteins. Uh -huh. So, First of all, I, I will 
try to talk to you about a little bit about these enzymes, which are these enzymes and how these, en these enzymes were designed for this purpose. So, as I told you, these are engineered enzymes, so they are enzymes that were selected using diverse methods for perform this activity and with that carry mutations, spawn mutations, sometimes a lot of mutations. And basically can be divided into groups, biotin ligases and peroxidases. So this one, biotin ligases, uh, are the basis of the method that is commonly known as bioID. And these enzymes are um, enzymes that attach a biotin to another protein, which is a very specific substrate of this enzyme, that is called biotin-dependent carboxylases. So this, as, as, it's, as I told you, biotin ligases are very specific for these substrates, and the reaction they catalyze is the APO biotin-dependent carboxylase in the presence of ATP and biotin forms the uh, biotin-related protein. The mechanism of this enzyme is, is known in these cases for one typical enzyme that is this protein from E. coli. And in the first step of the, of the catalytic process, what happens is that biotin and ATP in the active site of biotin ligase activates and form this very reactive intermediate that is called biotinyl 5-MP that is kept in this, in this place because it interacts with a very specific lysine of E. coli enzyme. So this interaction keeps this reactive intermediate in place and after this it can react with a specific lysine of the substrate, the, prote the protein biotin dependent carboxylase and transfer the biotin to this enzyme. So based on this mechanism, this residue is very important to keep this active intermediate in place. So when this residue is mutated, what happens is that in the intermediate is liberated from the enzyme and then it can modify almost any protein that is in the nearby region of this protein at a specific or uh, at amino residues, basically primary amines that can be mainly licensed but can be also in terminal amines or whatever. So by this mutation, the enzyme was converted in a very specific enzyme that only modified this protein to an enzyme that is able to introduce a biotin label in almost any protein around. So this is the basis of the method and what happened is that in a cell, you have your cell that has, that express this bait linked to the biotin ligase and you have many interactors in the cell and you have also proteins that do not interact but are they are there because they share the same subcellular localization and other proteins that move around the cell. So you incubate this cell with biotin and what in, in initially was a, an hour time scale, you can, you can um, by the incubation with biotin, it start the labeling and you form a cloud of active or reactive um, compound that is going to modify everything that is around, including the bait, the ligase, the, the, the interactor proteins, the bystander proteins, and any protein that can be, during this period, moving, at going through this cloud of reaction, reactive <laughs> compound. So at the end, we will have a, a sum of all the interactions that have taken place during these hours. And these are either physical interactors or proteins that co-localize co with our bait. So after, oh, we are not seeing the whole, the whole thing seems to have a problem. Doesn't matter. I will just say that after that, we can make uh, something that should be here. It's a filter purification based on biotin and MSMS analysis. No, you, you can see it here, but there. I don't know which is the problem. Okay. 
and then you identify the proteins that were in close proximity to our bait in, in our experiment. Um, so this, this, ex, this strategy based on Biray um, relies on this modification, but after that there have been many more improvements of this enzyme using direct evolution and the, uh, many other proteins with m a lot of mutation have been um, used, uh, they call turbo ID or mini turbo ID that can do the same but in much shorter times. So, because the problem here is that we, we are doing an average of a lot of things that are happening in this pe period. So to do more precise uh, labeling, which is mostly needed if you are going to study dynamic process, then you can have to use these other versions of the, of the protein that can do the same in very short periods. And they are also being explored other, other sources, not E. coli, but the, in this case, this is a thermophilus uh, that has a, a smaller protein that also can carry this, this arginine substitution to perform promiscuous bi biotinylation. So the other group of proteins are the peroxidases. And you, many of you ha may have used and, uh, the, the horse radish peroxidase enzyme. But in this case, the most used are uh, soybean enzymes uh, uh, based on ascorbate peroxidase activity. And these enzymes are uh, catalyzed one or two electron reactions, and they, they, they roll mainly to scavenge peroxide in, in, in plants. And, but besides this reaction, which, is, which gives the name to the, to the enzyme, it, they also catalyze the, the, uh, the oxidation of many other substrates. And in particular, they can use phenolic compounds as tyrosine, for example, and they form these tyrosyl ra radicals that are really very reactive and have very, very short half-life. It is estimated to be in the order of milliseconds. So this, this, um, this reactive compound is the one that introduces a, a mark in the proteins using these proximity <coughs> labeling approaches. In particular, what we use as substrate in these cases is um, biotin tyramide, or which is called phenolbiotin, that is a derivative of, of, of phenol or tyramine that contains a biotin. So when this radical is formed, what, it happen, what happens is that it introduces a biotin label in the proteins in the surrounding. So in this case, uh, there are a lot of enzymes that are being developed as well to improve the performance of the apex, including monomeric, uh, for example, these mutations improve, uh, diminish the, the ability to form uh, dimers, so it's, it's better as, as a reactive. And this one, for example, improves the activity towards phenolic residues. So uh, all these things are, are going, are happening and are, and are improving the, the, the enzymes we can use for this kind of approaches. So with Apex, it's basically the same as before, as with BioID. The only difference is that in this case, our bait is coupled to an Apex enzyme, and as substrate we use phenolbiotin, and we have to put hydrogen peroxide for the enzyme to have the both of the substrate it needs. And this hydrogen peroxide incubation is really short. It's in the order of seconds, less or, at or one minute. So it's a very short uh, incubation with, pero with hydrogen peroxide. And then we have the same process. The, the, there's a cloud of reactive phenoxyl radicals that introduce this biotin label in the proteins in the surrounding. And mainly in this case, the amino acid, the residue modified by this, uh, by this um, radical are tyrosine residues. It can be others, but tyrosine is by far the most frequently modified. And the, in our hands, it's the almost the only one we, we could found in this kind of experiments. So just to, to see what happened here, so we have 
the biotin tyramide that in the presence of peroxide and the apex enzyme generate this radical and this radical reacts with tyrosine and other electron-rich amino acids to form this compound covalently bound that carries a biotin. Is it clear? Yeah. Okay, so then we have the two main uh, uh, methods that the ones based on biotin li ligates con called BioID, the one uh, based on, on ascorbate peroxidase called APEX, and the, the process afterward is the same, and we have to consider the, the, the half-life of these reactive uh, products to calculate or to estimate a labeling radius of, of the molecules, how far from my bait protein can be labeled, and this is still an open question, but there are some calculations that have been made, but we tend to think that this might be dependent on the specific system we are studying, whether it is a membrane protein or it is a soluble complex or whatever, but this, this uh, labeling radius for both of them is, is calculated around 10 and 20 nanometers, so this is really labeling things that are close, very close together in the cell. So to have an idea of what this, this distance means for a cell, if you can see here a human cell, an average human cell, which have around, well, I don't think I can say an average, this, <laughs> this human cell, it's like 20 micros, and then you can be see that the P body is around 50 and 150 nanometers, and a model protein of around 100 kilodalton is three nanometers. So this, this is really uh, labeling things that are in very close proximity in the cell. Even though in this 10 nanometers and consider the velocity of diffusion of a protein in the cell, you can still label a lot of things that you don't want to label, in, in, in fact. So here, this protein that is diffusing across the cloud can be a lot of proteins. And also you have other things that are, are happening because of course your protein is being synthesized in the, in the correct place in the cell, so ribosomal proteins are going to be systematically labeled because you need to, to, to uh, before the bait goes to the correct site in the cell, it, it, it's labeling things uh, in all the way. So, as I told you, then uh, we have to then purify these biotinylated proteins based on these high affinity columns we have, and we made quantitative proteomics to identify the real interactors that we would like to fish. So this means that we have to do a lot of controls, a lot of controls to Substract unspecific binding, bystander proteins, the endogenous biotinylated proteins, because of course this reaction occurs in by other enzymes, not only the ones we are putting into the cell. So this means that we have to perform a lot of controls. So when you would like to design one of these experiments, you have to take into account the different controls, your system, and the different, um, the different advantages and disadvantages of this BioID and APEX system. For example, if we compare them between biotin ligases and ascorbate peroxidases, there's a key difference in the residue they are modifying. So maybe the results we have with BioID and APEX is not the same because we need different s residues to be at the surface of the cell to to be modified by our enzyme. In addition, the substrates are different. Here we add biotin, here we add phenol biotin and hydroxyl peroxide. So the advantage of this one here is that we introduce a label that is not present in our, in our cellular system. So in, many, in all systems there are biotin-related proteins, Ma much or less, but there are. In, in mod uh, proteins modif modified with this artificial substrate there are no. So this 
can be used as a as a advantage to to have a real mark of the activity of our enzyme. Of course, the lab labeling time is different. Here we have minute to hours, and here we have seconds to minute. So, for example, if you're going to study a very dynamic process, if you're going to study, I don't know, the response to a signal response, uh, you have, it's better to use this approach than this one because it's, it's more, use shorter times. And the half-life of the species is, is also different. And then we have a lot of controls that are the same for both approaches. And that is how to cor corroborate the expression of the bait fused to our proximity-dependent biotin lation enzyme and to make functional and localization controls that I will show you briefly a list of the things that we, we need to check. So the first thing that we need to check is that our, fun our protein, our bait, has the same fun function native that fused to our protein. So this not al is not always easy. It depends on, on our bait, on our system, on our question. But w if we have an enzyme, we can check that the enzyme activity is the same. If we have uh, an, um, a phenotype related to our activity, of course we can check that the phenotype is conserved. And, and we have in some way to check that we are not introducing an artifact in the function of our protein by fusing it to our, our um, biotin latent enzyme. Then we have to check the subcellular localization, and this is really important because we are going to explore the neighborhood. So we need to know that the protein goes to the correct place and the place where it goes in a normal situation. We have to check, or it's good to check the expression levels of the pro fusion protein. So the more close to the physiological level, the best, of course, because we are, again, not introducing artifacts. And the other point is it might be necessar necessary to explore w where to put this fusion protein because, um, for example, uh, you have, in our case, we, we have a protein we are interested in and we put the fusion protein at the N terminal and at the C terminal and for sure at the C terminal all the interaction was disturbed. So this C terminal was very important for interacting with other partners in the cell and putting the, the, the enzyme there makes a mess. So mm, this is something that maybe you can um, think in advance if you know your system and if you know how this protein interacts or then you have to, to really explore it in, 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 ex in the real life. The other controls you have to do is to, to see that the uh, proximity biotin lation sign works. So it really introduces biotin in the next, uh, in the neighbors of your protein. And for that, for example, you can do simple Western blots uh, and check that uh, the enzyme is increasing the, the whole levels of biotin lation in the cell. And for example, here we have, uh, this is one of the things I'm going to show you in the next one, but here we have used an apex, so we can we incubate with phenol biotin and aldroxin peroxide, and you can see that in the wild type, not not expressing the the fusion protein, we have not much change, but but changing the things. Of course, we have biotin related proteins, but when uh, expressing the bi the bait with apex, then we only see this this um, activity here, the presence of many biotin related proteins when we incubate with both phenol biotin and peroxide. So this type of controls are necessary. And of course in the case of, of apex that you put hydroxin peroxide, you also need to quench this because you don't want that when you lies the, the cell, the peroxide and the apex enzyme will continue biotin latent things. So you can quench this and you have to check that this quenching is really effective. So this is basically the same. This is the real experiment with both reagents. And here it's the one who only has one of the substrates, phenol biotin, 
And here is the same experiment, but the quenching was performed before adding the substrate. So we are sure that this quenching is efficient and does not lead to more biotin lation. So then we have to do, which is maybe the, the most important part, is to subtract, subtract all these uh, proteins that we don't want in our list. So for that, there are different controls that can be done. So we can compare the interactome, the proteins we recover, with the same experiment with the same cell line or strain, but without the fusion protein. So this is not the, the most recommended, because what we can take off here is proteins that are not labeled with our fusion, because the cell line does not have the fusion protein, but we cannot subtract the other the other proteins that are labeled with our protein but are not desired. So the best control here probably is to have the same line or strain but expressing the protein alone, not fused to our protein. So it can biotinylate proteins that are abundant, ribosomal proteins, whatever. And in this case, it's important to check that the expression levels are in the same range. And also, we can sometimes compare with a protein, uh, a cell, sorry, uh, a cell line or a strain that express the biotinylation independent protein, but associated to another protein that goes to the same subcellular location. So in this case, we can subtract a specific proteins by standard proteins that are in this location. This might have a problem because sometimes there are real interactors that are abundant in this location, so if we use this, we can, uh, it can be at the cost of losing true interactors that we are considering in this case uh, as, as background. And the other strategy very used uh, uh, is that to compare multiple baits. So when you compare multiple baits, the background, uh, similarly as the approach that are used for other interactomics may be the same, so you can subtract this. <coughs> so in any case, you have to design these experiments in very specifically for your problem. You need a customized design and you need, need to use quantitative proteomic experiments in order to perform this kind of analysis. So you can compare your interactome here in, in white with the background with using any of these controls. And then you have might have proteins that are statistically represent uh, present in your control in your experiment, but not in the control. This might represent interactor if you perform the statistics. And also among these proteins that are common to both. They are proteins that are really overrepresented in your experiment, and these represent also real interactors of your protein. So, finally, um, I would like to show you uh, another approach that can be used for, uh, for proximity proteomics that is not based in purification proteins but more in purification peptide, in the purification of peptides. And uh, in this case, uh, the, the, the workflow is almost the same. S it's only that the digestion process takes before enrichment. So here we purify biotinylated proteins, digest and perform quantitative proteomics. And here we digest purifi pur purified biotinylated peptides and then perform quantitative proteomics. And this strategy has many advantages that can uh, allow to define better uh, interactors. So one of the points is that in this case, we identify the protein. In this case, we identify the specifically the biotinylated peptide. So it gives us some clues about Spatial, spatial and topological information of the interaction. So, and also, this, this is also important. 
In the case of Apex, as this label is not biotin, but is phenolbiotin, it also allows to differentiate endogenous biotinylation from biotinylation mediated by Apex. So these approaches, I, I'm gonna tell you one of these, there are several few ones. This one of these approaches is called BioSite, and it stands for Biotinylation Site Identification Technology. And basically, basically it, it, it compares the here the protocol I showed you before based on the capture of proteins biotinylated, then perform digestion, and then identify the proteins. And this identification relies mostly in, on unbiotinylated peptides because of the very high affinity of this interaction, the, the peptides we recover better are not biotinylated, but we can identify the protein with these peptides as well because we don't need to have the specific biotinylated peptide to identify the protein. However, here, the approach is different. We rely on peptide purification, so we are going to have mostly biotinylated peptides, and in this case, the affinity they use is different they don't rely on biotin, uh, avidin or biotin, streptavidin, because it's, this is very uh, a very strong interaction. They are based on antibodies. So this increases the recovery of biotinylated peptides, which are then analyzed by uh, LCMS MS. And using this approach, they have the advantage that they can identify in the mass spectra the reporter ions that confirm that this peptide is indeed biotinylated. Here, well, I think it's, it again, it's not seen as it's here. <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter. And this, these are reporter ions that tell us that this, is, this spectra corresponds to a biotinylated peptide. And using this approach, this author showed that if they compare the, na the number of biotinylated peptides recovered by the conventional method with this biocide, the numbers are huge differences between them. And if they compare the, the proteins identified, they also are big differences among them. And these might represent not, not all the times a bi a real interactors on biotinylated proteins. So there are other strategies that have been also used based on the same principle. This is the deep beat strategy. That's the same. And we still have five minutes. Yes. Uh, the other thing that I would like to mention just very briefly is this other approach that is what is called context-dependent proximity labeling. And, and in fact, here, what is, it's based on the classical protein fragment complementation assay when we, when a reporter protein can be split in two proteins and uh, these two proteins can be bound to, uh, to two um, proteins that are supposed to interact. So if this interaction, is if there is no interaction, we have no activity because this split protein is inactive. This can be an enzyme or can be a fluorophore. So it is, if this is split, it has no fluorescence anymore. But if this protein interacts, they bring the two fragments together and we have a readout that can be the enzyme activity of the fluorescence. So this same approach can be used with the protein-dependent biotinylation enzymes I showed before. So we can have the information about interaction partners that are only labeled with when two proteins interact. So this gives us a lot of uh, possibilities to analyze um, interactomes, and in fact, we, have, we are using some of these things to avoid the, the label of, of ribosomal proteins, or abundant um, in bacteria, abundant metabolic protein, and to recover interactors of our protein of interest only when, when it forms a complex with another one that we know uh, takes it to the right place. So, but in our case, it's under development. In this case, this author have published this 
uh, they have used split turbo ID and they have select the N terminals and the C terminals of the, of the in, in this case, the protein ligase that can be fused to different, to different uh, here interacting proteins. There are two proteins that it interacts in the presence of rapamycin. So when rapamycin is present, these two proteins interact and then the enzyme is active and is, is able to label the, the proteins that are in the, in the, the surrounding. So this was uh, shown to, to really work using um, neltravidine that really uh, detects the presence of biotinylation. As you can see here, without rapamycin, there's no, no biotinylation. And with rapamycin, you can see here that there is biotinylation. And this was used to study mitochondria endoplasmic reticulum contacts. So in this, in this case, they, they use um, proteins that they know that go to a specific location and they mark resident proteins of the endoplasmic reticulum or the mitochondria. Uh, they, pardon, fuse these proteins with, with this and wi with an N-terminal or C-terminal part of the turbo ID so in this case, they can really map things that are happening in this interaction because if you, you perform um, bioID with a protein resident of the endoplasmic reticulum, you're going to label all the proteins of the endoplasmic reticulum. If you use some of the mitochondria, you're going to label all the proteins of the mitochondria. So how you can focus only in this uh, interaction by using this fusion uh, or this split um, technique that can really put the active enzyme when marker proteins of these two surfaces are together. So uh, using this strategy, and this is uh, textual, the, the authors uh, identify uh, and reach in 100 endogenous proteins, including many not previously linked to this interaction, the endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria. So the, the good things of, of, of this strategy, and, and is the good thing of proteomics, discovery proteomics in general, is that you can find things that you will never have looked if you were thinking on previous knowledge or it was based on previous hypotheses. So I will skip this and just show you this, these two slides because I think that this is really interesting because it's, this is a real in vivo bioIT. So in, in this case, the, the, the experiment, the, the bioIT experiment was performed on mouse. So in this case, the, the using viral express uh, target protein fused to, to, to this protein, Virac is the bioID, the biotin legase. They inject this in the cortex and hippocampus of the of the neonatal mouse, and then after 24 days, they start injecting biotin to induce the, the labeling. And as you can see here, there was no biotin here. And after in, in the seven days, when they start adding biotin, they, they start to see in the different regions of the brain the presence of biotin related proteins and using this strategy they purify the proteins from the different regions of the dissected from the brain and they identify new proteins that are part of this, in this case, of this inhibitory postsynaptic um, density uh, regions that were uh, not possible to study by other means or to isolate by other means. So really to finish, uh, just to show you that these two strategies, BioD and Apex, have been introduced very recently, or very not very, they are not very old, let's say in 2012, 2013. And since this, the introduction of these techniques, there has been an awful lot of work done. So in the case of Apex, for example, it was used to study the internal inner, inner membrane of the mitochondria, the mitochondria intermembrane, the um, junctions of the plasma membrane with the endoplasmic reticulum, the primary cilia, uh, signal transduction or response of protein G, uh, lipid droplets, strep granules, and just to tell you the more relevant one that I, I select, but there are many, many others. 
And the same is true for BioID, so it was used to study initially the nuclear lamina. You can see that these, both these techniques were introduced almost at the same time. And then the, the centrosome, the nuclear pore complex, the focal addition, complex mediated mm, postsynaptic inhibition. This is the one I have shown you that is really in vivo. And finally, this year was published this human cell map that it's the biotinylation dependent human cell map that is based on 192 baits that were labeled with BioID and were used to map the location of around 400 proteins in the cell. So this is all I have to show you. And just I hope that I could show you that proximity labeling coupled to MS is contributed and for sure will continue to be contributing because there are many enzymes being developed and uh, to a better understanding of the interactions and compartmentalization of proteins that to sustain the functioning of the cell at the molecular level. And just the last thing I would like to say is that I'm talking about enzyme biotinylation, but there are other ways to perform uh, proximity uh, labeling that are not based on biotin, that introduce other labels, and they are also useful. These are the most studied and the most common. That's why I focus on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Rosario, for that great talk. Uh, question for Rosario. Uh, Rosario, many thanks for the talk. I have three questions regarding the comparison between BID and Apex. Uh, the first one is, in BID, you use a substrate ATP. So is this a risk when plant, when I'm just thinking in plant cells, when the system has different energetic status, if you are comparing Comparing, for example, an AMPK mutant or some type of cell that has different energetic status, and ATP is the substrate. Could you have one type of cells more prominent or to to generate the biotin ligase or something like that? This is the first question. Yes. The okay. second question is a BID, which is the radio, the radio of labeling, that I, I just skip it. And the third one is, uh, actually it's the most important for people that work with plants. What about the temperature of the function in the apex and, and, okay. and BID? I know nothing about plants. I work with bacteria, but I will try to answer. <laughs> um, regarding the, let me remember, the last one was uh, the temperature. Um, I think these are engineering themes, so probably in the future you will have the enzyme grown at the temperature that you want. but by what I, what I remember now is that for, for um, Apex and BioT, there are some temperature differences in the, in the optimum of uh, biotin ligases and peroxidases. And if I don't remember bad, one is 37 and the other is 30. I don't know if this range is, is really important for, for your system, but... 26 are a bit 26, uh, so maybe you can choose the 31. <laughs> And that, that's one point. The other thing was the radius, I guess. Um, uh, the, the for BioID, the radius was calculated based on the known structure of the nuclear pore. So they performed the experiment and they have the, the structure so they can calculate the radio. I, I, I n I'm not sure this can be extrapolated to all the systems. Maybe I, I, would, I would say that no, but this is the, the best calculation made and probably in, in future papers there are going to be other calculations that will give us a better idea of, of how this works, but for sure for membrane proteins can be the same, for example, or for, uh, I don't know, for different composition of the lipid bilayer, I don't know, by if you work with bacteria, it's not the same that if, if you work with hex cells, for example, that, that's the, the cells that have been used for, for many of, of the works. Ah, the ATP. Good question. <laughs> uh, now I don't know. I, you, the answer is you have to try. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I don't know which levels of ATP your cells can have, and and how it compares with the ones required. And I don't know affinities of enzymes. No. Hello. 
uh, for that one, the, the last one that is uh, uh, for the ATP, I don't have any idea, but for uh, the biotinylation in plants, the, there's a paper, uh, and the, uh, I think in Arabidopsis too, uh, if you're interested, uh, I can send you the paper, and I have the coding sequence for Turbo ID if you want, uh, which is the protein uh, that they use on that paper. Yeah, and I have a question. Yeah, uh, I, I'm searching some protocols. I'm working with Turbo ID in particular. Okay, but um, and in these protocols, they do two controls. One uh, using uh, Turbo ID fused to a uh, signal peptide that sends uh, Turbo ID to the same localization that you work uh, for your protein. And they do a basal uh, control that it's the same cell uh, but with no uh, Turbo ID. And they subtract both. I don't know what you do in this case uh, or how you use the controls. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm asking this question uh, because of money, because I need to <laughs> do you one have to do more, more experiments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the bits that I am using are very expensive. Uh, uh, okay. In this, in this type of experiment, I, won't earn, I wouldn't use the controls to earn money because these are vital so okay. the more you can do the best uh, in our case we don't we don't use we, we are performing apex not bioid and we don't use the wild type strain why because what what we found is that when we use the the wild type strain and we compare with the one who has our bait expressed in the bait we have slightly proteomic changes, no, not just proteomic changes. Uh, so I don't understand uh, the word. Uh, Sorry? Uh, uh, that one word that you said. I Wh don't which one? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I lose. Uh, with that. Uh, it's like this. If you have the wild type strain and you have your strain sp or your cell line, whatever you are using, expressing the protein, your protein fused to BioID, then this is from our experience, you have to check that the proteomes of both are the same. Because in our case, using the wild type didn't work. Because our, the small levels of expression of our protein fused to abate induce small, relative small proteomic changes, general proteomic changes. And when you use this as a bait, when you use this as a control, you're purifying the background and even with very slow difference level, the background is different. So the background is really a mirror of the proteome. If your proteome changes, your background changes. So if you can use the same cell line that has your protein overexpressed with different things, different color, I don't know, it depends on your protein, can be a point mutant that is inactive, can be just, uh, I don't know, but you have to, to yeah. check for the protein. For in our case, the first experiment we did, we repeat the proteomic changes in our, in our recovery. So we have to improve a lot the, the things. But I think that a, 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 a control with wild type or with only the, the bio ID, it's needed. Because Both. you have, yeah. Because okay. Because the most abundant proteins you are going to recover are not the real ones. Our ribosomal proteins are m abundant enzyme, metabolic enzymes, or whatever. So you have to take this off, th off the list. Okay. Uh, uh, and if I do only the turbo ID fuse to the uh, signal peptide? <laughs> that goes uh, to the same place? Uh, yeah, it's going to the same place. And, and well... Uh, you think I will the lose? A score yeah, the problem there is that you can lose true interactors. So you, you many, m most of the people use this control, but you have to be careful and to know your system and to know what you because I I if if goes close to your protein, we label the same things. Okay, I I, I maybe <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I really don't. Know. It's just uh, turbo D floating on the nucleoplasm. Mm. Mm.
No. Last question for Rosario. Thank you, Rosario, for that wonderful talk.